Right. So hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's Quran Seminar. Uh, we have two talks today. Well, the first speaker is Paul, who is visiting us here at Brown right now. Uh, Paul is currently a data science engineer and associate researcher at Data Observatory Chile. His research interest encompasses integrative solvers, authentic communication, freely informed neural networks, and boundary element methods. Uh, welcome, Paul. You may want to start sharing your screen and start presentation. Well, thank you. Uh, give me a second so I can uh, stop. Mm. Well, okay, I, I start. Well, hi everyone. Um, thank you to the research, the Crunch Research Group for inviting me today, inviting us. Uh, I'm Paul Escapil. Uh, today I, I talk about um, a theory and some results about biparametric operator preconditioning. And we try to see how we can get to uh, operator learning with that. So as uh, Zon uh, told, I'm a data science engineer and associate researcher at that observatory. Uh, that observatory is a, a non-profit from Chile. I'm working in Chile and we uh, handle uh, open data from astronomical events, for example, uh, Earth resources, and uh, all that time we try to well, perform, uh, for example, intelligence, artificial, artificial intelligence tools uh, above on top of that. So let's get to the outline of, of this talk. Um, I start with a, a short introduction and define the abstract problem, some toolbox, some tools that we need, some theoretical tools, so we can uh, lay the biparametric operator preconditioning uh, theory. Uh, then we'll we'll get to iterative solvers, and as a conclusion, we'll see how we can get to uh, our operator learning and why all this theory is very like well suited to get towards operator learning. About me, uh, first I, I've been uh, researching uh, more the traditional methods. I've been working on preconditioning. It's the talk of of today. I've been working on boundary element methods, iterative solvers, and uh, it was for my my PhD. And since uh, 2021, uh, I, I started researching uh, physics in neural networks. Uh, working, I've been working on GPU acceleration, on a, a hyperparameter optimization. And here we arrive, uh, 2023, uh, trying to maybe get back to preconditioning and try to put things together so we can couple them. Keeping with the same structure, from our side, we have the traditional methods. Other side is the machine learned uh, based method of the in in particular of the crunch group, and well here it's it's like maybe uh, going to the extremes, but uh, maybe with my experience uh, we know that traditional methods are, are well understood. There are a lot of theoretical results in general. You know how everything is going to behave. You have some convergence bonds, everything, so we can see in some sense that there are no surprises, and with uh, the new machine learning based methods. Um, in general, you can have some very good surprises. You can break the curse of dimensionality sometimes. Uh, you can get some very impressive results, but you always also can get, uh, let's say, uh, bad surprises in the sense that sometimes, for example, with the training or the hyperparameter selections, you can get troubles and it does not converge and you don't uh, understand why. So coming from this, uh, it is a, a challenge for both community to try to couple these paradigms together and to try to get what is best from each one. So now let get, let's get to the, the theoretical results. Uh, during this talk, we'll focus on uh, petrov galicki methods. Uh, I'll present a pretty abstract formulation for all of this. And well, here are the classical results. I like the theory. It's pretty interesting because it's pretty abstract, but you will see that it can represent um, many problems. So in general, uh, one gets to re reflexive bank spaces. Uh, we get we are working with continuous circuit in our forms, and uh, we start with the continuous problem that is uh, in general in this case assumed to be well posed. So this is the starting point. We have a continuous continuous problem, and we have all the functional analysis theory so that we can get the well-posedness of this kind of problem. And generally, next step is to discretize this problem. Here above, we have an example of FEM uh, results. 
And uh, we define discretize, uh, discretization. We arrive to a continuous from the continuous to a discrete counterpart, which is quite similar, but in this time is posed in a finite dimensional uh, subspace of the of the continuous ones. And next step and last step in general, it's already the same uh, the, the same story. We arrive at a linear system that we want to solve. So there are these three formulations, and we'll see that there are uh, some. Uh, link and relations between them, and it's very important uh, for all the talk to, to come. And well, uh, coming back to operator uh, learning, uh, it's always the, the same. We have properties on a continuous level, and we want to try to adapt these properties and maybe extend the properties to a discrete level first, and then to what is happening for, for example, our iterative solvers. This is the context. Uh, a few tools of interest, uh, which are very important for this kind of analysis. First, uh, I, I just defined the duality products. I speak about Strong's lemma, with, which is very important for this work. And I'm going to present. I'm presenting. Uh, then we get to interactive solver as some of conditioning. First, uh, the duality product is just uh, to say that. Uh, in general, in this case, in our setting, we can identify the Sesky linear form with a, a continuous linear operator through this form using the duality program, the duality pairing, which is defined here. It's just about notation, but it's uh, pretty interesting because, in general, in this case, we get some counterparts. Uh, this is the continuous program that I defined before first, and we see that we have a sort of strong. Uh, equivalent problem, which is defined as an operator equation. The same happens on a discrete level. We can define a, a, a strong counterpart to our discrete problem. So here, we again, we keep playing with notations and definitions, and you see that we have a weak discrete problem and a strong discrete problem. Then if we get further on that, uh, you'll, you'll see if you, if you write everything uh, with formulas, we see that once we get to matrix level, there are some mass matrices that are involved. So this equivalence be between weak and strong uh, problems uh, will involve some mass matrices that will be taken into account in the theory I will, I will show now. We assume that the continuous problem was well posed, but in general, uh, over our discretization, we have continuously scale linear forms. So in general, to uh, to guarantee well posedness for the discretized problem, uh, we have to use and 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 prove that there are some discrete insub constants that are involved. So here is a definition of uh, of the discrete insub constants in our case. So remember, this constant uh, all over the 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 talk is a discrete insub, and when once we have this discrete insub, we can from the continuous problem. Uh, uh, extends and uh, concludes that our discrete problem and our max matrix problems will be well posed. Sometimes, for example, in the simplest case, uh, the discretive soup one can use, for example, for an elliptic problem, you can just use the elliptic the ellipticity con constant, for example. But here we are in a quite abstract uh, setting. Now let, let's get to Strang's lemma, which is a very important lemma uh, in the numerical approximation. Because when when you solve your uh, you have your solver in general you always have some approximation that are induced. It can be machine precision, it can be quadrature rules, geometrical error when you use for example covalent elements, and all of this has to be quantified. Uh, since I'm from the boundary element community, uh, in general we always use fast methods such as the fast multiple method or hierarchical matrices, which also include some error that we have to to quantify. So here, an example of geometrical matrix matrix. Uh, here you see the geometrical error, and you have to be able to 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 say and to uh, to 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 have some conclusion about what what it will be impact, how it will be impact on your linear system. So strong lemma you see is about how to guarantee well postness and control the error. What happens here? It's again with the quite abstract and formal setting, but we are with a continuous level. We have our 
original problem and we see that we uh, define a perturbation problem. So it's pretty common uh, we define a perturbation parameter that is defined in that way. And we will study what happens on the perturbed linear system. So this new all around this work will be the perturbs uh, will represent the perturbation for our system for the uh, what could be uh, stated as the stiffness 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 matrix, which is uh, the linear system we're solving. And here is the the classical Strong's lemma in this case that is. Uh, Defined in such a way that we can uh, track constants. Um, it's maybe a, a complex formula, but I, I'll explain it to you. And uh, well, for you, so, so so that you can say, many results in this talk um, are parts of uh, the bioperator operator preconditioning uh, paper uh, that I've been uh, working on with Carlos Geles during my PhD studies. First strong lemma. What what it states it's it gives you a bound on the error between the continuous solution and the perturbed one. So once you can get this kind of approximation, you can ensure first that the problem, if in this setting, you can ensure that your your perturbed problem is well posed, and this is this bound. You can get and you can track how uh, the the error will behave. To get into details and maybe more important to, to go for small new, uh, we have here, if you get to small new, you have a quasi optimality constant. Here is the best uh, approximation error. So it will be like a CR's lemma or a classical lemma. It's like the, the, the normal case, let's say. And here we have what the, the perturbation is doing to our system. And you see that you have a new term that will be the, uh, the main term in this error. And to conclude, you can say that, well, uh, a new error in your in your system, in your operator and your right-hand side will induce a new term error for uh, your approximation. And for example, if you are working with finite element method with P, uh, P pi squares polynomials, um, for the L2 error, it will be this kind of, of estimate that you seek. So you, you say, yes, uh, my perfect, my unperturbed numerical uh, scheme is going to converge like this. So I try to ensure uh, my perturbation to uh, follow the same pattern. Last part, in general, we can quantify our error. We can perturb our system. N next step in general is to uh, apply iterative solvers. So as you know, we start from uh, a given vector and we will apply uh, a scheme so that we get a, a succession, a sequence of, uh, of approximates such that it converts to the solution. So we define the residual and for uh, symmetric positive definite matrices and Hermitian matrices, one commonly uses a uh, conjugate gradient for Laplace op uh, operator, for example. For the indefinite case, uh, one gets to, for example, GM res or its restarted version for L, L mods or Maxwell equation. Here you have an example of, of convergence. And what we want is to try to uh, have the residual to uh, decrease as fast as possible. And hopefully I H independently, because H is the mesh width of our, uh, our approximation. And if we want it to be stable, we want the residual, for example, the convergence of iterative solvers to be stable and optimal. It's called optimal with, re with respect to H. Sometimes with some operators, you can get other parameters and then you have you, you add other dependencies, for example, on the wave number or, well, there are many, many examples of that and it would be even better, but one wants first the H independence and if you can get further, you can try to get uh, some scheme that are going to, to give good behavior with respect to external parameters. Sometimes the iterative solver won't convert at all. And I'm going to show uh, some theoretical results about this convergence. So uh, one uh, simple way to, to try to accelerate convergence is using preconditioning. In this case, with multiplicative preconditioning, it's we try to uh, seek another matrix such that we multiply our system and this matrix is supposed to be cheap and easy to compute and to lead to an approximation to the identity and perform better that original system for iterative solver. So we arrive at a preconditioned matrix problem, which is defined here. 
it's just multiplying multiplying uh, preconditional as a, a multiplicative preconditional. And uh, with respect to iterative solvers, um, there are some bounds. The bounds depend on the matrix. For example, for uh, the emission case, when you apply the conjugate gradient, you can get this bond, uh, which depends on the spectral condition number, which is the uh, highest uh, magnitude and lowest magnitude eigenvalues. It's the ratio. And when we apply the conjugate gradient, for example, we have this uh, very well-known uh, linear bond for conjugate gradients. It's a linear bond because here you see that uh, there is a geometrical um, um, decay, decay of the of the error, which is this row. What you see is, for example, when h the mesh width tends towards zero, uh, in most cases uh, we have that. If you don't know, do anything, if you apply, for example, to a Laplace uh, a Laplace matrix uh, without preconditioning, you we, you see that the spectral condition number uh, tends towards infinity, and uh, this convergence bond uh, shows you that. Uh, uh, you won't you won't convert at all. From that comes the idea of operator preconditioning, which is our first important tool. We see that, for example, for Laplace operator, uh, we have, for example, a squared uh, a, a squared growing growth in the condition number spectral condition number. So uh, again, we are trying to find a preconditioner for that. Um, one point here, uh, for example, for, for FEM, for finite element methods, uh, there exist uh, many ideas about how to build this kind of preconditioner. And here we are with a technical and abstract recipe for that. Here I present the continuous problem. And what we do, uh, let me get back one second. Uh, you, you you see here that, for example, for Laplace operator, there is this, uh, this square. Uh, behavior and it is due to a mismatch between uh, spaces between for example the domain and the range spaces because you have for example pseudo differential operators so you have derivatives and this involves at the end uh, this this kind of behavior so all the idea of operator preconditioning is to try to get in some sense an opposite order preconditioner you have for example um um an operator that, that goes for H1 to H minus one. And in this case, you'll try to build an, another operator that you will uh, add as a preconditioner that will map uh, H minus one to H1. One example could be the inverse operator. So how does it work? Uh, I'm going back to the continuous problem and the idea of operator preconditioning. Uh, here I take as a reference a, a, a paper by Hidmeyer, but there are uh, many papers that have been working on that uh, in in 2000 and between 2000 and 2010. Um, and the idea is always to try to uh, describe a setting, in this case, uh, such that we define an operator that will ensure an endomorphism at the end. So here we have all these tools that will allow us to create some space uh, mappings and we arrive at a preconditioned problem that is uh, mapping the same function spaces. This is very abstract, very general, but as examples uh, in the boundary element community, uh, we can't uh, define such operators, for example, with, with what is called Calderon relations. Uh, for finite element method, it could be a multi-level uh, preconditioner, for example. All of these uh, can be, uh, well, this theory can be applied uh, to any of these cases, uh, any of these examples. And, well, this is what we were looking at. Uh, when we apply this kind of preconditioner, we can prove that the spectral condition number here uh, remains bounded with H. Because here, all these constants that appear are the continuity constants for all this operator and the discrete in sub constants. So this is the general recipe, and you say that when you apply this kind of technique, you arrive at a bounded and optimal condition number with respect to H. The same almost happens with the Euclidean condition number, which is different for non-normal case. I, I, I speak about that. But you see that you can get some control, and it depends on um, basically how you map uh, the, the, the function spaces between your discrete and, and, and uh, uh, coefficient space. Uh, to give an example, um, if you have uh, no grading, 
for your, your scheme, uh, this constant remains bounded. But if you have like bad uh, quasi-optimality quasi, quasi constant with your mesh and strong mesh grading, it, it can explode. So for the moment, it's, it's pretty uh, uh, OK. It's a well-known theory. In this case, it's in a pretty abstract framework, but we are OK with that. So let's get to what is the, the, the main idea of that, is to try to apply this operator preconditioning. But you remember I showed you with the strength lemma, we, we could control the error. But what I, I, I want to do here is to try to apply uh, kind of estimates, like in strong lemma, but to this operator preconditioning case and, and see what happens. And uh, the main idea here is that we will see that, in general, uh, the strong lemma say, tells us that our numerical scheme uh, is supposed to, well, to reach good convergence. In general, we cannot relax too much the precision on our uh, impedance matrix because we want our scheme to be precise. However, when we get to the preconditional part, and this is the idea in one sentence, uh, and it will be proved here with the theoretical results, the idea is that you do not have to do the same with your preconditioner. It's, it's, it's maybe quite logical, but it's very uh, powerful and important. And it states that, well, your impedance matrix, you have to be very careful, but your preconditioner in general will be uh, behaving very well if you use a very rough approximation. And it allows you to use different tolerance for the preconditioner from one side and the stiffness matrix. So iterative solar performance is robust with respect to operator perturbations. And this is what we are going to, to see now. We are going to repeat the same analysis again as in for operator preconditioning, but this time we will add a new tolerance, uh, a new perturbation parameter for the precondition. So everything as before, uh, impedance matrix with a new parameter that will be in general pretty low. And we can play with the preconditioner with the maybe higher tolerance, the new parameter. We repeat the same analysis. We arrive at a part of system. We can apply, apply strong type lemma. So we have well post problems. And if we see what happens with the spectral condition number, uh, something pretty interesting happens because we have these results. And it shows you that uh, you have this one constant, for example, here, that shows you that in general, when you increase uh, your, your, your mu parameters, you can play with that and get a controlled spectral condition number. And you do not have to, uh, for example, to, to use a very, very uh, precise approximation for operation condition. So if you just have bonded uh, mu and new parameter, you will get at the end uh, some bonded spectral condition number and your scheme will be, uh, will be stable. To keep working with theory, uh, I, I presented a few results for iterative solver in the conjugate gradient case. But uh, when we have an uh, indefinite case, for example, for Helmholtz problem, we do not uh, have the same uh, kind of, of estimates. And when we apply GMRS, for example, we, the, the spectral condition number is not enough. So we need to add more information. To do that, I need to define a few, a few tools. Um, here first, we will restrict to H to the domain space as being a Hilbert space. And uh, we, decide, we define the matrix H field of value. Uh, the field of value is here defined. It's when you, well, you, you see here, is uh, when you, you, you apply your matrix uh, and uh, the, the, the scalar products uh, with, 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 the, with this field. So it, it tells you some information about how your, your matrix will behave. So it's about uh, spectral, the spectral world and the open spectral operator. Here we are on a matrix level, but there are some counterparts on continuous and discrete level. There is a, a whole theory about, uh, about that. But uh, this, uh, this will give us some very precious information. So we have our, uh, our field of value and to be uh, with less formula now, uh, I try to explain how it works. Here, for example, uh, it is a matrix that is not uh, not normal. So in this case, the it, it, it happens that the field of value and uh, the, the the eigenvalue will differ in in terms of the the convex rule. So let me explain. Uh, first, in green, this is the matrix Q, and here I show the matrix uh, Q at minus one, the inverse. It, what I plot here is 
first I apply all I plot all the eigenvalues of this matrix. So you see here all the eigenvalues of the matrix. I plot uh, the minimal and maximal eigenvalue in, ma in magnitude. So here we have both. We see that uh, in this case, the matrix is invertible because the, the minimum event value is not zero. Here we have the zero with the red cross. And uh, in green, we have the convex hull of the ingate value. In the normal case, this convex hull will be the same as the field of value here. But here you see that the, the, the case is not normal. And the field of value is much bigger than uh, the convex hull of the eigenvalue. And you see that, for example, the zero is included in this field of value. And the same happens with the inverse matrix. OK, so let's let's see why it's important. It's important because when we apply GMRES, uh, so GMRES is the iterative solver that is commonly used for indefinite case uh, with its restarted version. Uh, we see that we can get bounds on the residuals, which were quite similar to what we had for conjugate gradients, but this time the bound depends on the field of value, the minimal distance to zero of the field of value. I yeah, it's different here. So you have your whole field of value, and you see where it gets closer in pro in relatively to zero, and using that you can get a bound. So this gives you a, a, an interesting recipe again about, uh, for example, if you have an indefinite uh, um, matrix, well, for example, if, if I precondition it, I will try to get a final a field of value that does not uh, have zero inside of it. And to give a, a further example, uh, there are some formulations, for example, I don't know, uh, Helmholtz equation, for example, uh, is an indefinite. But if you use a, a small wave number, for example, uh, you can um, prove that uh, this field of value will get away from zero. This is a, an example. So we are uh, with a way to quantify uh, how GMRS will converge. Uh, it, it was here. We have this bond, which is very general for general matrix. And uh, what, what we have now is that using all these operator preconditioning framework, and with uh, further assumptions on how uh, the discrete inf soups are working, we can uh, prove that we can get for GM rest for the uh, H GM rest in the Hilbert setting, we can get this linear convergence bonds. And what is very interesting here, uh, I didn't define it uh, yet, but here, this is the bond for the GM rest with the Euclidean product, which is the classical GM rest. Uh, no, this sorry. This one is the the bond for the uh, GMRS with the H norm, and we see that is totally H independent. And here we have the same constant as before, but we see that we can also apply uh, the Euclidean product uh, GMRS, which is the most um, conventional product in the traditional GMRS. Okay, so we have this offset factor. We have again everything, and you know we are going to apply the same recipe. We are going to plot everything and see what happens. And it's again the same. Uh, I, I work with the Parton problem, the Parton operator preconditioning case, and again I can get the similar bonds, uh, which depend on this constant again. That was the constant involved in the spectral condition number, and it tells me that I can have a way to control how GMRS is going to behave and ensure that I will have some linear convergence estimate for my scheme. Mm -hmm. To finish with this linear problem, um, again, we see that if we only bound both constants with H, we can guarantee convergence. It will not uh, explode. Everything is going to be, to, to be optimal. Now, let's see how it go with time. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go to, to, to that. So far, we have been working on linear conventions. So you saw that in the indefinite case, we have to work with a, a special property of, of operator uh, properties and operator uh, theory, which is the field of values. But as always, if we can get better estimates, we can try to, well, to get and to go deep inside operator theory. And here, uh, after the field of, the, of value, there is something else, not the eigenvalues, but the singular 
values of the operator. And uh, when I told you before that when we seek a good precondition, we were uh, trying to seek something, for example, that was an endomorphism. Uh, we also uh, also said, I also said that we could be looking at something that gives us approximately the identity. So what is approximately the identity? It can be the identity plus a compact operator. So this is what we have here. Uh, it is in a very uh, general framework, but we define the Kalman class, uh, which is um, a, a way to, to describe the compact operator. So in all these new results, we will consider that once we precondition our problem, we arrive at something that is close to the identity, which is the identity plus a compact uh, was norm is defined like this. So again, we keep working with the same way. Uh, we simplify rather the, the, the kind of, of setting that we can uh, we can work on. And um, well, it's a pretty ugly <laughs> results here, but I, 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 I try to, to explain that. And what happens here is that uh, when we consider our parts of problem, if we assume that the final uh, problem is a sort of identity plus compact, here it is here. Here is the, the compact operator that we have. So our here you have the final numerical system minus identity, which is his, the, this operator. If this operator is compact, we can prove that uh, the GM rays, in this case, the non-restarted GM rays, uh, will converge super linearly. Super linearly. Uh, to give a further insight, here we have some constants that at the end do not depend on h, and here this is the mean singular value of the operator. And what happens, mm -hmm. for example, with compact operator is that the singular value tends towards zero. So the minimum value will tend towards zero, and you can see that the spectral rate, uh, the, this, this uh, convergence radius here, this constant, will tend to run zero uh, if you have enough iterations. And again, go, co going back to the biparametric operator preconditioning, we see that if we have rough preconditioner, uh, here at, at least we have some control on what will happen on this superlinear convergence results, and we can control our scheme, and we can define a pretty, well, a pretty, a low, uh, a, a low uh, precision preconditioner for our skin, and it will behave well with H. So here we see that weighted uh, GMS converts super linearly. Uh, again, as always, there is this constant that that, that are involved uh, when we get to the classical Euclidean GMS, and it allows us to control our skin. Here, I, I've been using a slide that was uh, that, that I, I, I presented uh, two years ago. And at this time, I was I was telling that, well, we have all this theory, we everything is, is robust, everything is pretty understood. Strong lemma are uh, tools that people are, are, are used to, for example, to see what happens when I put on my operator and my matrix and so on. So all of this gives us a recipe to craft and to try to craft preconditioners and to try to find ways to, for example, get preconditioners that can be assembled, ass assembled pretty fast and well, that do not need to be so, so, so robust and well, to converge and to have all this uh, polynomial decay and so on. So that was the state of the art and that was uh, the idea of, of, of this work two years ago. And well, there is there, there is always some some works to do because here we are considering on only the h uh, the h bonds, but well in the in the perfect world for example if you have single hypothetical problems if you I high wave number analysis you will try to uh, to craft preconditioner that allows the scheme to be quite robust with uh, this kind of parameters, and uh, the, the, there is quite some work to 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 be done on h GMRs, which is so the weighted version of GMRs. There are some work of, of that is pretty well understood, but so far there are no, uh, there there is no, for example, SciPy implementation of this kind of te technique. So this could be a very interesting uh, work and tool. Well, it was two years ago. So what happens next uh, on this on, on this year? Uh, Blechta 
has uh, given results for the convergence of GM rays, not in the case of identity plus compact operator, but for inverse plus compact operator. So this is an extension and all the biparametric uh, theory can apply to this uh, kind of result. So very interesting results because it's much more uh, general. Um, also in case of, for example, uh, Helmholtz equations, uh, uh, A1 Spence and his group have been working on uh, developing uh, theoretical results on what is happening with high wave number analysis. And they supply estimates of, for example, how the field of value will behave with wave number. And there are a lot of results. And now uh, in the in the recent years, we've been understanding much more uh, how FEM and BEM uh, schemes are, are, are working with wave number in some cases for uh, star-shaped uh, objects, for example. And well, uh, here, the, the Crunch Group and uh, George Kanak, the group, I've been working uh, in particular on, on this INS uh, uh, work uh, recently, which is a way to accelerate uh, the, the preconditioning and to couple uh, operator preconditioning deponents with multi-level uh, multi preconditions. There are some results also uh, which use deep learning to try to accelerate the preconditioning and to accelerate multi-levels that are quite general, not using deponents, but there is some literature on it over the recent years. So as a conclusion, uh, what is interesting here is that all these theoretical tools uh, are rather abstract, but give you bounds, allows you to quantify what's happening with your scheme that you can precondition with a, a, a very rough approximation. So all this theory is very mature. And uh, what I, I found very important here and about the way to couple traditional methods with the, the, the physics inform and uh, physics information learning, operator learning and so on, is that uh, sometimes it can be hard to access the code, for example, an, uh, a finite element code uh, that was uh, implemented uh, 20 years ago. In general, it is hard to, to, to access to the core of this kind of codes. And this is why I find to be very powerful with precondition, because you can just keep working with the same uh, code as before, and you add another layer where you can add, for example, GPU acceleration and all the model tools just for your preconditioner. And in this case, you have a vision of preconditioning as uh, an accelerator. But well, the part which is about the precision, the traditional method and so on, you keep it uh, exactly the same because you need your convergence bounds and you need everything to be stable and robust. So, well, the preconditioning in this case, the multiplicative preconditioning can be, can be used in general as an external, external black box. It's just you, you can uh, independently uh, define your black box. <clears throat> you implement it with other technologies, and you can get on it. And well, it's it's maybe to to finish the, this talk. Um, what happens also is that all that I've, all the results I presented so far in general are for one problem. So every time you get a, a new mesh or a new problem, well, you have to apply again uh, GM rays, and you have to craft again the, the preconditioner. There are recipes and there are ways to uh, have preconditioners. We know how to uh, build these preconditioners, but in general, they will be used just for one simulations, one simulation. And here, as you, as you can understand, uh, it is the, the way uh, towards um, deponents and operator long because it's it's a waste of time at the end because for people who are solving many problems and who have a lot of data about the problem they solve and they could offline and try to get a better way and a more efficient way to have a kind of preconditioner that can apply to more cases and where are we going what, what's next next step about this so well uh preconditioners in this case and multiplicative preconditioner are, are, are very suitable for uh, offline learning and um, what is interesting here is, for example, in, for the BEM community, uh, operator preconditioning is well known because we have some relations. So we know operators that can precondition our system. So it paves the way towards, for example, physics informed uh, operator learning for that, because uh, at the end, you know the operator, you know the formula, you know how it works. So this information can be added to your scheme. And we could try to imagine that we are using a sort of uh, operator learning scheme to get a rough preconditioner that we will work in our case. 
And well, there are some result and strong type uh, approximation results on generalization error for deep nets. So there is some some formulas and some work that has uh, have been uh, performed before and the way that deep nets are, are implemented and by, by essence of deep nets, it's very suited to the H optimal um, preconditioning. And well, it's a uh, last point. There are also some, some work on uh, going beyond uh, a given problem or for example, H analysis. Uh, here it's about why I'm, I, I'm, I'm talking about, well, having, for example, a parameterization of shapes. I've been working on all this uh, shape optimization. And in general, you can prove uh, results on when you have a, a, a parametric on a family of shapes that are suitably defined, you can get with some holomorphic uh, properties. In general, you can prove that uh, you can represent with a, a deep net, for example, you can represent well uh, your operator. So everything will be quite perfect to have uh, a kind of theory so that we add and we use all that uh, has been uh, implemented before with deep nets and so on uh, just for the preconditional part and it will be uh, pretty efficient since it's, it's, it's proven here that uh, we do not need to be so so robust on that well thank you a few reference here uh, all the first part was uh, quite abstract, so these are uh, classic uh, books uh, that explain all of this. The, the Ern and Gamon book, for example, has all of this abstract setting for Petro Galikin and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for your presentation. Do we have any questions from the audience? Hey, um, hey um, this, this is Adar, Adar. Yeah. Right, right in the next, next room. room. Um, um, from Brown, Brown we just, just met. met. Um, first of all, what I really like, like especially the um, urban, urban this is something we're really, really uh, looking, looking into right now with hints and. Um, okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Also, um, sorry, Adar. yeah, and um, let's talk later. We have a lot of things to tell you about, like high wave number um, holds that we're doing right now and uh, especially like the homomorphic uh, structures. Um, I was wondering actually like from, maybe I missed it. I'm sorry if this uh, question is not in place, but um, so you're doing a lot of error bounds for preconditioners, that's great. Um, and then you're using them to estimate the preconditioner or to create the preconditioner. That, now, now, this part is missing from you right now. How from the theoretical error bounds, you get your your um, prior knowledge that helps you build those preconditioners. But, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's the reverse way. In, in, in this case, uh, all those bounds are assuming that, 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 that you know uh, the precondition that you're applying. But, and uh, that, for example, you, you know how to quantify uh, the error uh, with strong lemma. Uh, how to choose this preconditioner, how to find this preconditioner is uh, actually the operator preconditioning um, paper at the beginning that uh, explains uh, and gives some examples. So uh, as I told before, for uh, FEM, uh, the vast majority uh, of uh, preconditioners that are used in, in, in practice uh, are some kinds of, of, of this because all the preconditioners that you have in general, people are looking to a sort of uh, identity plus compact and they say that everything is going to work well. So multi-level methods can be represented as this kind of problem. Um, for BEM community, all the Calderon identity type uh, preconditioners uh, can be represented like this. Um, for Helmholtz, the if you use a shifted preconditioner, for example, uh, you can prove at the end that you are doing this opposite order preconditioning. So it's part of the of the operator preconditioning theory also. I don't know if it's okay with... Yeah, yeah I got it. Uh, uh, so you're creating a preconditioner using the operator preconditioner, and then you're building a theory on top of that. Yep. Uh, also for shifted Laplacian and whatever, you can just do the same. Okay, got it. Yeah. Thank and, you. And then, well, for, for all of us, there, there are... This operator preconditioning it is called also equivalent operators. It, it these are works of Axelson. You, you can get to those papers, and there is a vast amount of of, of theory, and they 
for many type of problems they are uh, building this kind of operators i see i see so you can basically create the theory that for any realization in the Barreto scheme you can get a bound cool okay i i i should look into that cuz this could be my this could be very helpful for hints because we don't necessarily know a lot about the preconditioner because of this, the 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 nature of the depot net inside. It's hard to apply a theory for that. But if we can just use one of those um, bounds from the Barreto scheme, that could be really cool. We can we can discuss that later. That that could be a very nice follow up work. Thank you. Okay. Um, Paul, the the theory is very powerful. The question is is the depot net. Uh, has the properties of the operators that you are requiring. So what are the properties that, or the attributes that the operator has to have? Well, uh, here the, the theory is, is pretty abstract. So I, I think that for Deponet, we could start with a, a, a more simple problem. But for example, if you say that the Deponet so far uh, with hints, for example, I guess that we could prove that uh, the ponets are uh, approximating, for example, a multi-level solver. So here we, we we could fit into the theory. But to go further, I, I guess that we could try to uh, imagine that the deponet is a, a tool, and not, not not related to a multi-level solver or anything. And um, the traditional, uh, what you really need is to prove that you have the adapted mapping. You have the good mapping space and well, this mass matrix and so on. I think uh, I, I I do not understand Kisan enough how Deponet works to, but I feel that it, it there is something like uh, about that, that the the way that Deponet are are, are are crafted allow you to get this kind of projection and restriction that uh, make that everything is working well. But but you have a a set of requirements for the pre, for the operator now. Not if it's suitable, if it's suitable precondition, but if it's what are the minimum requirements? Mm. For example, is discretization dependent or not? Yeah, um, th this thing um, you have to ensure. What first you have your operator, like, like the kind of approximation of the inverse operator. You have to uh, prove that you have the good uh, function spaces mapping, so that should be okay. You have to prove that you have a discrete in soup or like do you have some kind of in invertibility on it. And uh, finally, there is this kind of mass matrices that allow you to map everything okay. So this is my question. I, I'm not re I'm not sure so far on what replaces these mass matrices with deponents so that everything is working fine. Because you have some kind of mass matrices that uh, can map things uh, that have to be to have discrete in soups. And this is like the, the last last part, but well, I feel like there, there is a, a relation between both. It's, it's think, kind of the same thing, I, I, I think. I think Professor, what, what he says is like, in the deep we have the trunk. In If we have a known discretization for that, for example, for a multi-grid solver, we, have, we always know the, the, the discretizations we're using in each level. We can just push, just like separate the trunk put the points into the trunk and get the projection that you're doing, like, sorry, it's not the projection, it's just the space you're projecting onto. For that, we can use this theory because we know the discretization and we know how it behaves. We just need to project to, to, to do a forward pass through the trunk and it might be sufficient to get the theory for that. But but the, the mass matrices, you can, we can build the mass matrices from the trunk. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, because that gives you the basis, so you can take the inner product of that. That will give you mass matrices. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. Like before, you take the ein sum. You you take the right. just before the ein sum, you'll get everything you need for the like um, for the theory to to yeah. Okay. Any other question? All right, thank you, Paul, for your presentation. Uh, we're going to move it out to our second talk. And yeah, thank you for presenting your work. And hello, Weipeng. Thank you. Hi. Can you hello. hear me? 
Yeah. yeah. Thank you for Thank you. agreeing. Yeah, to join earlier in such a short okay. notice. Yeah. So, uh, our second speaker is Wei Peng Li, who is currently a professor in School of Aeronautics and Astronautics, Shanghai Jiao Tong University. His research interests span the areas of war, wall turbulence, aeroacoustics, and machine learning. A common thread of his research is to understand the dynamics of turbulence and its relation with the turbulent friction drag and no noise generation. Special attention is paid to computer-assisted artificial intelligence in aerospace engineering. Uh, welcome. You may want to start the presentation. Yeah, I can see your screen. OK. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, thank you for the invitation for this seminar. And uh, yeah, I'm Wei Peng Li from Shanghai Jiaoling University. And this work was done with my two students, Chen and Wang. And uh, the last co-author is my, my wife. She is also a professor in, in the university. And uh, here is my a brief self-introduction. And my, my major is fluid dynamics. And I'm particularly interested in the water balloons and aerocoustic. And recently I do some work for the machine learning. Yeah, this is outline of my, my report, my presentation. And the first is about the motivation and objective. And third and second is methodology, and then the test and conclusion and field plan. Yeah, because my major is in the aerospace engineering. So in the aerospace engineering, the air dynamic shape of pneumatization is of particular importance. Especially if we want to design an airfoil, a wind or a wind turbine, and we need to do the shape optimization. And generally, we can show the navier location to get the, the force, the lift and drag, and the, the fluid field around the, a solid body. But uh, for the three-dimensional optimization, the computer cost is very heavy. So we need to build a, a surrounded model to show the PDs uh, at fast speed and with good accuracy. Yeah, and uh, with AI, and the uh, deep neural network can be used to say, so this forward prediction. For example, if we have a new airfoil and we want to know the flow field around the airfoil and we want to know the force, uh, a force uh, from the airfoil. So we can get a well trained deep neural networks and we can do the projection from the input parameter to the observing data. And actually, the neural network is a nonlinear projection. And there are a lot of methods, for example, for the RNN, CNN, and GAN and PIN, to name a few, can do this work. And uh, yeah, the CNN is very powerful, powerful tool to solve this forward prediction. And uh, in the CNN, and the input is a distance from the wall surface, and the out output is a flow field at the observation grid points. But there are some problems in the CNN, although it's very powerful. And uh, the problem is, is because the only structure this set can be fit or output in the CNN because and uh, because the curvilinear grid around the F4 need to be reshaped. That means, and here we have a grid around the F4 training edge, and uh, it has physical locations with x, y, and uh, physical locations need to be transferred to a uniform index with i, j to this map, and uh, with i, maybe 1 to 3, and in the j direction is also i, 1 to 3. So the transformation from the physical location to the uniform index space will ignore the physical uh, coordinates. That means only one to three, only one to three. There is no physical coordinates. This is the first point. And the second, the transformation will neglect the non-uniform of the flow field, especially near the uh, near the in the near near wall region. Because in the wall, in the near wall region, we use the very fine grid distribution to resolve the severe velocity gradient. And uh, because if we use CN, it may cause large errors near the wall. This is a problem in CN, we, we think. 
And essentially, the problem is that CNN treated the unaligned observation data to be aligned. And uh, what is aligned and what is unaligned observation data? For the aligned observation data, the physical coordinates of the observation and uh, are fixed under different input conditions. That means the uh, coordinates was, was do not change at different initial condition, different boundary condition, or different uh, 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 other uh, sort of terms. Uh, but for the island observation, the observation uh, locations varies with the uh, input code uh, conditions. But for example, if we go back to the Air Force case, and it's a typical unlanded problem. That means if you have a thick airfoil and the grid around the thick airfoil, uh, the grid distribution around the thick airfoil like this. But if the airfoil is thin and the grid is changed with the deep, with at the different uh, wall boundary condition. So this problem is a typical unaligned observation problem. But usually in the CN, they just treat the unlanded uh, data as a land, but with a landed data, I'm sorry. So just use IGK to 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 treat to 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 train the CNN network. Another point is about air force shape uh, behaves like a wall bound condition in the no linear system. And uh, yeah, it uh, has some physical meaning. And uh, here is the depot night. And uh, maybe you were familiar with vertical net because these were proposed in your group. And I like this this network because because it had two network. The branch net received the function input, and the trunk net receiving the temporal or spatial observations. And use two network to receive the input and the observation, and the explicit use of the independent sub network to handle information with different physical meanings itself is a, a, a embedded periodic knowledge. That's why I like this, 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 this network. And I, I, I uh, work with my student to do some more work. But uh, the deep night can handle both aligned and uh, uh, unaligned data set with different operation. That mean in the deep night, if the observation is unlanded and the cartier production are used to get the forest casting the output matrix. If the observation uh, data are unlanded, the output matrix is bounded by a dot product, a dot product. Uh, and uh, Although there is a cutting product and a dot product, it causes some problems. And first, for the cutting product, and it's a typical case for used before, and a lot of people just use the for the unlanded data, but nobody care about for the unlanded unlanded data set. In the unlanded state, the dot product restricts the input matrix must be repeated by k times to match the dimension of the grid matrix. And that mean, that mean, maybe I will go to the last page. And uh, I, in this page, in this, this figure, we shows, we, we show the dimensional resolution, dimensional resolution is the network and n, we can name it as the total number of the airfoil, maybe we have uh, 100 or 200 air force to be trained, to be training, to be trained. And the small k is the dimension to describe an air foil shape. Maybe it has a, we need to describe an air foil and uh, we need to k dimension parameters to describe the air foil, one air foil. And the capital K is grid point for the two dimensional observation field. And uh, this is the dimension, and this this is the uh, input, the dimension of the function matrix, and we use FNN here, FN here. We, we can use other CNR, other network. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. 
But finally, we have a cutting project here and to get the output metrics. But for the island data, because, because the observation grid is changed with different cases, different airfoils. So the, the grid metrics here was enlarged and also to use the dot product and the function metrics, the dimension of the function metrics are also uh, repeated by k times to match the, 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 the dot product to get the right, right dimension of the output metrics. So the problem is that the data repeat, repetition or uh, you change, you challenge the network training and deteriorate the prediction accuracy and heighten the memory requirement. Yeah. So, and also for the POD, it's just uh, used to handle the uh, landed data, but it cannot handle the island data, although it improves the prediction accuracy. So our uh, objective in this work is to develop an operator regression framework for the unaligned uh, observed data. So how to do that? First, we need to know the key issue in the depot net for the unaligned data is the dot product is restricted by the, by the, uh, by the input matrix uh, repetition. It, it should be repeated by k times. This is the key issues in the, for the depot night. So can we replace the dot plot by other operation, operation? And then we propose to use a hybrid decoder depot night framework to handle the island data. That means the dot product is replaced by the decoder night, by a decoder night and uh, use this network and use this framework, the dimension, the dimension of the resolution can be greatly reduced. Now first of all, we need to prove the decoder is correct, uh, to the decoder depot net is correct. First, the extension of the universal parameter theorem operator is given in the theorem two. And uh, here is a, dot product, dot product, this is output matrix, and we can have this, uh, this, this theorem. And second, the dot product is an operator, so the dot product is able to be upper-mixed uh, upper by a decoder network. Actually, it's true based on the universal product theorem of functional, and uh, we, we replace the dot product by the decoder, and we will get that the decoder depot net keeps the current state with the universal approximation theorem or operator. That's our proof. It's very simple. The, the key point is the decoder, the dot product can be replaced by the decoder, by a decoder network under this theorem. And uh, the advantage of the hybrid method is due to the flexibility of the decoder, the dimension of the input matrix can be reduced. And the, the dimension reduction is very helpful for the network training and the improvement of the prediction accuracy. accuracy. And we will sh show the, the accuracy improvement in the next two, in the, in, for, for two cases later. And uh, this, this dimension reduction is similar to the POD depot net. And the second, second, the decoder depot net can be easily extended as a multi-input form. And for example, we can use a uh, input augmentation by the mean field of the label data and to add a, a multi-input network here to further in, improve the prediction accuracy. So here we give two cases. The first case is about the dust problem, but uh, especially this is a, a landed dust problem because we use a grid distribution is randomly distributed in the, each case. It's not a uniform distribution, it's randomly 
select in each direction. And uh, here is the samples and uh, 200 samples for test and CNA in the branch and trunk and FNA is in the decoder and have primarily come from the our paper published in the archive. And we also tried a lot of tests to get the, the good uh, result for each for each method. <clears throat> Here we give the training data sites for the deep all night and uh, decoder all night um, for this problem. And uh, the resolution, ha we have three resolutions, with the resolutions. We can see that uh, for the uh, deep all night, for the traditional deep all night, and uh, the function matrix uh, is very large. It's repeated by by the k times. K is uh, the dimension of the operator data because uh, the grid is randomly is, is random distributed. And here we give the MSE loss of the depot night and decoder or not and the multi uh, multi decoder. And we can see that regardless of the grid resolution, the depot night the decoder depot night performed better than the all night in reducing all the uh, test which the training or training errors and testing errors and uh, the superior performance is achieved by the multi form the second case is the prediction of the flow field around the airfoil and the res numbers the mark numbers or angle check is given here and uh, we do the the reference average the simulation and with an open source CFD code, CFR and uh, the code has been uh, validated. And uh, we generate the 200 airfoils in total and 80% uh, for training. And our first ship is represented by 256 points and fit in the branch, dire branch net directly. And we compared compared four cases. The first one is traditional depot night, and the second one is depot night, but we can ignore the unaligned observer data, and we can directly uh, regard the data is uh, is, uh, is is aligned. That means the depot night aligned method. And uh, just the difference between the two is the input for the track night the first one is XY, and the second one is IG, is the index. And the third one, in this case, is POD deep on night, and similar to the second one, and the input in the track night is also the, the, the IG, the IG the index. The third one is the, the, the hybrid decoder deep on night, and the input is, is XY, and is uh, treat the the observation as 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 the unaligned, and the, the 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 fourth one, the fifth one is multi decoder depot night with input augmentation. So and also the parameters can be found in our paper. Here is the result. Yeah, for the MSE loss of the of this case, first we can compare the. The first the four the first the three cases, we can see that if we use the if we use the analyze method and the, the the errors can be can be is better and uh, the POD depot night with a uh, aligned method is the best for among the first the three methods because because. Because and dimension in the depot night in the case two and the case three, the dimension reduction is used for these two cases, and that's why the two cases accuracy or the error is is is, is small. And if we compare the decoder all night with uh, with the first the three cases, we can see that the Decoder depot night is better than the first three, and the multi decoder is the best. Is the best, particularly, and uh, these two cases are several orders of 
make it lower, the error are sec second, uh, several order lower than the, than the first one, than the first case with an aligned data. And uh, if we look at the flow field predicted by the networks, here is the truth value and this alpha shape. And in the training, uh, selects randomly uh, in the in the test uh, data set. And uh, this is deep night, and this is absolute error compared to the truth value. And uh, yeah, and uh, the distribution, the, er the absolute errors would reduce the from the depot night to the depot night unlimited and the PLD depot night. And then the decoder night and the multi decoder. Yeah. And uh, if we compare the two, maybe you may be wondering the PLD depot night is good enough. And why we do this decoder all night? Because the uh, test error or the training error is somehow in the same order and do not have some, some significant improvement. So when we look at the two cases, we can find that we can find that the decoder is exactly reduced the, the, the training, the testing errors. If we go to the the in a near wall region, we can see that the errors is much larger near the wall, especially for the PLD depot night. That's why we we prefer the decoder depot night because we are interested in the the fluid prediction near the wall to get the forces, to get the leaf, to get the jack. And uh, then Weiping, I have a question for you. I have a question for you. Uh, yeah. Um, since you are showing the near wall region. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you guarantee that the velocity is zero at the airfoil surface? Uh, this is the pressure field, not the, the velocity I know, I know. field. I know. Mm -hmm. but, but, but for the velocity, because we're in this also in the shear stresses and stuff. So, so uh, yeah. How, how do you, I mean, I know you care about the near wall, but, but you also need to mm -hmm. worry about the velocity being identically zero at the wall. Yes. But you're not, unless you do something special. Yes. I uh, didn't do some special restriction or condition as well, just the from the air for shape to a to a two dimensional field. The two dimensional field is pressure, but it can be the velocity, but uh, it cannot uh, guarantee the velocity at the wall is zero. We need to do pins <laughs> actually. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. But in this work, we did not consider anything about pins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, may I continue? May I continue? Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, please, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. And uh, yeah, because we are mostly mostly interested in the in the force for the airfoils. So we pred we give the the the, the pressure the distribution, the, the arrows of pressure field on the wall surface. We can see that the decoder all night, the the pressure, the the pressure field on the wall surface is reduced significantly. Finally, we give the MSE error of the pressure field on the wall surface for all testing cases. And we can see that the decoder is much better, much better than the POD all night. And the POD all night with the multi input and the, the 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 errors can be can be further reduced as 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 expect that's that's nothing interesting because we need more information from the label data right okay finally i will go to the conclusion and we propose the this method actually is an improvement for the traditional uh, depot night especially we focus for the unaligned observer data and the observation grade is changed with the boundary condition. And also it can be changed with other initial and thought term and other, other, other conditions. And anyway, it's okay, but the observation grade location is, is, is changed. And we think all this method is, is performs. 
better than than the other ones. And uh, yeah, and uh, it's consistent with the operator approximation theorem. And uh, all about this, and the uh, accuracy is uh, improved as as I showed. And also the, the training is somehow also reduced because there's the dimension of the matrix is to, to reduced by the decoder. And also my decoder performed better. And all the data and all the code uh, has been uploaded in GitHub and you can check this, this, this link. And in the future, I think I we are trying to predict the, the unsteady flows because in the two case we just show the, the steady ones only the the source term or only the boundary condition is changed that there is no time no no time series and actually in the in the in the physical world the time series projection is very important so we are going to try the time series prediction with a new method and to check how does it work. The second one, I will do another work. It's uh, relevant, it's, it's, I want to combine with the resultant analysis. Uh, resultant analysis is, is used for to do the, the linear stability analysis for the linear stability equation. And we can get the, the most amplitude mode, and we can use the network to get the mode coefficients. And then we can get the prediction for the turbulent static and the fluctuation and the solidity flow field, maybe. And we are going to do the work recently. And if we have a chance, and maybe maybe half a year later, I can share this, 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 this this work with, with, with you guys. And thanks for your attention and thanks for your listening. That's all. Hi. Hi, Dr. Lee. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Vivek and I'm a PhD student working with Professor Karnidakis. I had a question. Mm -hmm. So in your case in which you are using deponent to predict the flow, okay. flow field around the airfoil, can you please mm -hmm. uh, one more time explain to me what was the input to your branch network and what you were trying to train the deponent's output on? Yes, uh, I want you want to me explain the network or the, 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 no, the, the input I, and I, yes, the input, the input and, and the output. output. Okay. Yes. Uh, the input. Mm, okay, I'll go back to this. The input is uh, the dimension mm -hmm. of the airfoil, maybe we have 20 point, 20, maybe we have 100 point to, to, to describe mm -hmm. the airfoil shape. In the okay. airfoil shape, maybe we have 100 point. So the dimension uh -huh. of the input is, is, is 200 because it's two dimensional, sure. right? Mm -hmm. okay. And the output is the pressure field, is a pressure field around the, the airfoil. Okay. And, and it's it, connected it, with the grid. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Thank you. So you trained it to predict the pressure field, yes. Yes, yes. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you. Okay. Vivek, the input is similar to what we did, right? Uh, we have points yes, on the airfoil. Yeah. There's a subtle difference. Like in our case, we consider only NACA geometries, NACA airfoils. So we consider the right. maximum chamber and the location of maximum chamber, two parameters. An alternative could be considering points or the control points of a spline defining the, uh, it could be a bunch. So here, Dr. Lee considered all right. like 100 points on the up, mm -hmm. on the surface of the geometry right, as right, input right. to the branch network. Yeah. And they're predicting pressure. I don't think they predicted the velocity field, I guess. No. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I didn't try that. Maybe I'll, later I will try that. Mm, yes. Yeah. The velocity uh -huh. maybe then, maybe can be stringed. I, I didn't. I don't yes, know. it could be difficult to enforce the no, no slip boundary condition on the surface I'll of the be. airfoil geometry. Yeah. Viv Vivek, mm. maybe you can put on the archive our paper so uh, Dr. Lee will see it. Yes, uh, I I will share uh, the link in the friendly. chat box. Yes. Should thank you, Dr. Lee. That's a great talk. Okay. Right. Thank you. Right. Sorry. Uh, Wait, can you explain? Uh, that model. 
expect single point. Can you turn so, off so turn off turn off the uh okay. Uh, Weapon, can you explain why uh, why you think the uh, differences in errors between POD and the decoder? What what is the reason? Uh, I think is I in one word I think our body is uh, is uh, I'm sorry. So project actually is 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 improved compared to traditional one. It's all about the dimension reducing, and uh, why this decoder is is better than POD? Because I think in the decoder we use the physical position as the input, but in the POD we just use the labels to educate. There is no educate. It it did not consider the the distribution of the grid, especially near the wall. I think this is the, the reason, like similar like the CNN, used in the CNN, because the POD used the, uh, a landed method. A landed method. The input is just I, IG, not XY in, in, in here. Yeah. Uh, in the, I'm sorry. Yes, in the POD here, just the IG, not XY. That's yeah, yeah. The, the, I think the reason. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Lee, can I ask one more question? Mm -hmm, sure. So while you are training your network, can you describe how different were the different geometries of the airfoil considered in the training data set? Uh, like if you identify it Training the network and uh, yes, doctor. I'll, I'll, yes, 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 my question was how different were the geometries on which the depo net was trained on? Because if the geometries vary significantly in the training data set, then it will be a more difficult task to approximate the flow field around the airfoil because they vary differently across mm -hmm. the training samples. It's a broader distribution we are trying to approximate. However, if the distribution is very narrow, for example, the different airfoil geometries are very similar to each other, it is much more easier yeah, to approximate. Yeah, yeah, you're talking too fast. I cannot follow oh, you. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'll say fast. I'm sorry. <laughs> you mean so the, I, for how to generate the grid near the training edge of the airfoil? No, 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 I mean no, that. no, no. No, Dr. Lee, I meant uh, in the training data set, I understand uh -huh. that you had multiple geometries of the airfoil. Yes. So how different were the different geometries? Are the different geometries very similar to each other or very different from each other? How did you change the geometries in the training data set? That was a question I wanted to ask. Thank you. Uh, are they similar? Oh, I cannot understand your point. Maybe later you can send me yep. an email. Wait, yes. let me let me mm. let me explain. Wait, can I can I explain? Basically, he's asking if this is the same NACA airfoil. Yes, yes. Or specifically, what is the distribution of parameters that define the geometry? Ah, uh, define the geometry. Okay, we use the BSR. Uh, collinear, uh, uh, maybe, uh, base there, we use base curves to generate the, the airfoil shapes. Bezier, Bezier curves, splines. Yeah, Bezier Bezier, curves. yes, yes. Mm. Right. And then you're changing the how is it like you're changing the geometry by 10%, let's say the camber, let's say the camber or the mm. thickness. Is it changed by 10% yes. or? 50%. Yes, yes, yes. Do that. Yeah, I know. I know. I know your answers. You know. You you mean that if the airfoil shape is changed significantly, right? From, from That's what we good. With the chambers. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so we have a dirty airfoil database, and we train that. And uh, yes, it doesn't. The result uh, is not not good like this, but the the. But the, the 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 tendency between these four these five five network is the same, but the arrows is, is somehow la, la, larger. If you include the ten thousand airfoils in the database, and the, the database is very 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 strange, like the work did by the Michigan University Arbor, they they have the, the database. 
from the UIC network, the uh, database, alpha network uh, database. Yeah, we're also working on that to use a lot of airfoils with different, very different shapes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, Professor Li. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Zhi Bo Wang, and uh, I mm -hmm. graduated from Shanghai Jiao Tong University at oh. 2019. Oh, really? And uh, I uh, used to attend your course and uh, 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 have teacher. Which course? <laughs> And uh, your presentation is very good. And I have a question. Uh, uh -huh. How many layers uh, in your decoder night? How many layers? And the uh, Chenbo, my students, Chenbo, <coughs> could you explain this problem? Do you uh, remember okay, how many layers in the decoder? Yeah, the best performance is a button, it's a button by maybe uh, we we use the same the the combination of of thing and F N so the so it contains the the decoder net contains decoder uh it contains the thing and the F N and we use uh we use F N two layer two layers of F N in the last two layers and the other the other is the same. Uh, so how do you determine the uh, layers the number of layers? Uh yes. Uh we have we have we have many we have many choices so, and we so uh the, the the this this the best performance is a button by the CN. So so you can try F1 or the other structure. So but I think uh, uh, the the influence of the of the hyper parameters cannot uh, uh, change the 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 com the comparison between the, the between the different methods. Okay, thank you. Yes. So, you. Uh, Dr. Lee Chibo is a mm -hmm. student. Do you recognize him? Did he actually take your course? He said he took your course <laughs> and he passed. <laughs> <laughs> is, is he saying I mean, that he, he, he is a good student? <laughs> and a surprise. And, uh, he, <clears throat> I'm just. He, uh, just now come here and uh, uh, start my PhD study. Mm -hmm. uh, there are observation of professor. Yeah, first year? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But he you, was, know, uh, can, you can send an email. We can get a connection. Maybe we, you visit the chat. Okay. Yeah, he, uh, Wei he was, uh, he, he did two years in Tsinghua for master's. Oh. <laughs> so, so he, oh, after Zhao okay. Da, he went to Tsinghua. Tsinghua. <laughs> he came here. <laughs> To <laughs> now he's at Bula Dashuan. <laughs> Tsinghua yeah. is top one and uh, our university top three. Yeah, but uh, Bosi is good university. <laughs> Very good, yeah. Very In China. Mm. Mm. Varun, yeah. do you have any questions? Um, Varun, Varun, maybe Varun will have questions. Varun is also doing the optimization. One second. Uh, yes, uh, hi, Professor Lee. Um, so one of the things that you mentioned for like the uh, reason for using a decoder was also to save memory um like do you have like an idea of how much memory you save by using yes, a decoder I'll share that. I'll just how many memory we use Timbua. my student Timbua, can you can you answer the questions how many like actually approximately we... how much you save in terms of ram usage when you like use a decoder net mm, actually we did not exactly count the memory we use and we just okay. compare the the dimension the matrix the, the dimension of the matrix for the input for the input for the input for the network. Mm. Yeah, I asked this question because when you create the network, it's going to use some memory, and depending on the size of your network, it could actually be more sure. than the size of the matrix. So that's the yes. reason I was asking this question. Yes, and. Uh, uh, dear Professor George, may I have a question for you? <laughs> uh, yes, but before 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 that, I, I want to tell you that uh, Varun, who just spoke, he has a paper on uh -huh. trans, uh, on ChatGPT. He used ChatGPT uh -huh. to design the airfoil to design the optimum uh -huh. shape. Maybe maybe Varun, you can put the paper on the archive of the archive on the on the chat for uh, yes. for waving. Really. It's chat GPT. Yeah, it's, it's our own version. Our own version. Yeah. So, so you, our own version. They put it. They put it there already. Maybe your student can copy it. 
But yes, you can ask mm. me questions. Uh, although I didn't give a talk, you can ask me questions. <laughs> okay. And if, um, for the for my first plan to predict the time series, uh, to predict the unsteady flow field use the depot night. How do you think does it work or, or has yes, some, some yeah, difficulty? It, it works. Yeah, yeah, it works. We we have done it. We haven't published it. Basically, what you need to do is to put in the trunk the history mm -hmm, of yeah. the predictions. Yes. So then you create like an LSTM through the trunk. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. I, I think we have a paper on um, on the bubble growth in the, the general fluid growth. mechanics. Mm -hmm. And then the general fluid mechanics, the first author is Chen Shen Lin from Tonji University, mm -hmm. uh, not far from where you Tongji are. Though. Yeah, not far from where oh. you are. And so he, yeah. so basically you predict, let's say, uh, the, the CP, right, as mm -hmm. a function of time. And then yeah. in the trunk, along with the time, you will put CP at T minus one, CP at T minus two, CP at T minus three. You put the history also there. Then it works. Mm -hmm. So you need, you mm -hmm. need to put. Okay. Because it, then it's like you can't do it. that, but yeah, the yeah. the input, but the input for the trunk neck is difficult. Is different. It's a time series flow field, right? No, and also the, no? the the input to the the branch will be the, the time series. The that's what I'm mm -hmm. saying. In the court in the coordinates, the trunk will have the coordinate. The coordinate. In addition to mm -hmm. what you're doing now, you also need to put the history of the quantity you're trying to predict. Okay. The recent okay. history, like the, the the previous five steps, for example, we have okay. done we have done that for an airfoil. We never published mm -hmm. we found that for an airfoil that is pitching like this at a different angle of attacks, and of course that totally unsteady the vorticity, and we were able to predict the vorticity on the wall of the airfoil as mm -hmm. a function of time. Okay, I see, I see, I see that. Okay, we'll try try that if we yeah. have good problem. Yeah, yeah. And and another is about the pin. I'm not uh, so interested in the pin because our the trend. Uh, this is my opinion. The pin I think is just uh, designed to reduce the, the 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 loss function. Or since the the, the network before the, the pin is very important. If the network before the pin is, is good enough, so the pin can um, how, how can I say that? How, um, uh, but the pin is for for the navier equation, it's part for the compressible uh navier equation equations, navier stokes equations, and uh, it will become very complicated to design a pin network. And it's very sensitive for the for the for the for the outer difference, outer difference, right? And uh, mm, maybe I can send you the email later. I can. Yeah, yeah. Send me the email. But that's fine, that's fine. The, if, if you fine. have any data, <laughs> the answer the answer to your question in general is pins is not as competitive as the numerical solvers if you don't have any data. Yeah. But the moment you have even one data point, one measurement, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. pins is competitive and and outperforms other methods. So, so okay. the idea of pins is, of course, to use it with some data that you have, some measurements, for example, mm, some measurements measure somewhere. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, like, like a, you have a pitot tube and you measure the pressure somewhere at the airfoil, which we do. Mm -hmm. All the airplanes have uh, pitot tubes. Then, pins would be more appropriate than any other method. Okay. Okay. I see. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, th thanks for well, staying up uh, late to to deliver your lecture. I know it's. Uh, very late now there, so thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Weipeng, for your presentation. Uh, are there any questions before we okay. close the seminar? All right. Okay, so it comes to end to this week's seminar. Uh, everyone has a good weekend, and see you next week. Thank you, Weipeng. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay.